uh, and the, our next agenda is the for the main discussion in this talk series, uh, and the discussion will be led by Dr. Ernat Adin Rujahyon, MPD. Uh, the time and the screen is yours, Pak Adi. Monggo. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Pak Zehar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good morning and honorable Professor Pirinder Jet Kaur. It's a great uh, connecting with you. And also Professor Zulkardi, pleased to meet you. And selamat pagi, Prof Zulkardi. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your joining this uh, talk series. And now we come to the talk series and we have uh, the opportunity to take part in the talk of two excellent keynote speakers. And first of all, I would like to thanks to Professor Kaur and also Professor Zulkadri as our keynote speakers. And yeah, uh, first, uh, yeah, our first uh, speaker, Professor Perry Derjet uh, Kaur. She is a professor of mathematics education at the National Institute of Education in Singapore and is one of the leading figure of the mathematics education and also uh, she has been uh, involved in several international studies and uh, of mathematics education and she offered give the speech in Indonesia such as in UNSRI, UNSIA and other institutions and now uh, she's uh, giving speech at the uh, Universitas Negeri Semarang and uh, in collaboration with the PPM uh, I and yeah uh, today, uh, Professor Kaur will talk about uh, improving mathematical literacy in PISA, uh, what we learned from the, our neighbor Singapore. And after she talk, we will give a resume in Bahasa Indonesia. And please uh, write your question in chat box. Bapak Ibu, monggo nanti kalau ada pertanyaan bisa ditulis saja di chat box. Dan nanti akan kita uh, sampaikan. Bisa dalam Bahasa Indonesia, nanti akan disampaikan dalam uh, Bahasa Inggris kepada Professor Kaur. And uh, ya. Yeah. Professor Kaur, I had a discussion with uh, Tohtin Lam in 2018 that uh, it's not easy to compare Indonesia and Singapore in uh, PISA. And, but uh, we wonder how to, we can learn from Singapore and we will hear your speech in about 45 minutes, Professor Kaur. And then we have uh, 15 minutes for question and answer. So now the uh, floor is your professor. Please, you can uh, start for the presentation. Selamat uh, pagi, tuan-tuan dan puan-puan. Uh, good morning, my dear friends in Indonesia. It is my pleasure uh, this morning to share with you uh, some of the work that I have done with my teachers in Singapore since the year 2000. So it is uh, actually a 20-year journey. It is not yesterday and today, but it is a long journey. I enjoyed the talk given by uh, Professor Totok, although I didn't understand much of what he said, but looking at his presentations, uh, I think the, the essence of his speech has been uh, that we have to teach in ways that students can make sense of what they are learning. And uh, I'm quite happy because that is exactly what my talk is about. Um, So, um, I want to start with uh, actually looking at what is the OECD mathematics framework. Uh, I think this is something Professor Totok did not discuss with us. Uh, what does literacy mean in the PISA study? Uh, mathematical literacy is actually a very big word. Uh, it involves your, the student's capacity to formulate, employ, and interpret mathematics in a variety of contexts. Uh, it includes reasoning mathematically and using mathematical concepts, procedures, facts, and tools to describe, explain, and predict phenomena. It assists individuals to recognize the role that mathematics plays in the world 
and to make the well-founded judgments and decisions needed by constructive, engaged and reflective citizens. I think in one of the slides by Professor Toto, we also looked at jobs for the future. All right. There are certain jobs for the future which are going to not exist any longer because of the advent of the computer and artificial intelligence. Now, why do we teach students mathematics in the school? First of all, it has a key aspect of the student's growth. And that is actually one of the reasons we have mathematics in the school curriculum to support students development of cognitive abilities to rationalize and make sense of knowledge and use it purposefully. All right. So we find that sometimes when we don't have the bigger picture in mind and we just look at mathematics as a set of rules, facts, and reproducible routines, we are not actually allowing our students to develop mathematical literacy, all right? So I just want to focus in this 45 minutes on one small aspect of the work I've been doing, and that can be summed up as uh, in a key question, uh, how can we nurture mathematical literacy amongst our students? Uh, this question cannot be answered in a very simple manner, but I choose to answer it in the most meaningful manner. All right. So for me, if I want to nurture mathematical literacy amongst my students, I want to do it through the mathematical work I engage them in the classroom. And this mathematical work must go beyond the recall of mathematical facts and standard routine applications of the mathematical facts. So just now, I think uh, Professor Totok showed you a slide about arranging the numbers from, I think, small to big or big to small. I didn't quite understand, but you have a fraction, you have a decimal, you know, and you are supposed to have a multiple choice kind of answers. Um, that falls in the category of uh, just working with basic facts and the recall of standard routines, all right? Then I think he had another question, which was in the context where the decision had to be made on some data that is given, and you need to use some of your mathematical skills to make that decision. Now, it is the second type of questions that will build mathematical literacy among our students, not the first type. Now, sometimes when we ask students questions that test their mathematical literacy, often they ask, the students will tell us, teacher, you didn't teach me this in class, all right? So let me share with you the first example, all right? This example is, testing your ability to reason mathematically, all right? The question is, what is a possible height of a street light? Professor, and, Carlos, sorry. Uh, yes. Are you showing uh, slides or not? Uh, yeah, I'm sharing, I'm sharing your slides. Oh, uh, will I send you the slides? Yes. No, we uh, cannot see your slides. You cannot see my slides? Yes. Why? I'm sharing, sh I'm in the share no, mode. No, not yet, not yet. We see your face. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you see my Yes. Okay, wait, hold on. So I go to, hang on. Uh, okay, I go to share, share screen. Yes, yes. I think. Share screen. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, uh, can you see the 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 slide now? Yes. Oh, yes. good, good, good. So you missed the earlier slides. Okay, Bali. Uh, we go back to the first slide. Uh, second slide. Okay. This is uh, mathematical literacy. Remember, I was telling you what is mathematical literacy. 
Uh, this is the PISA definition. This is the PISA definition of mathematical literacy. All right. Don't worry, uh, I will also send uh, Professor Zukaldi all the slides after my lecture. Okay. Then he can share with you, all right? So not to worry. So this is actually uh, the definition of mathematical literacy according to PISA. Uh, just now, Professor Totok didn't share with us this, but he talked a lot about this, all right? So I think we can actually uh, look at the definition. So it is the uh, individual's capacity to formulate, employ, interpret, not only use basic facts and use them in standard questions, all right? Now, um, as a teacher and as a teacher educator, one of the deepest concerns we have is how can we nurture mathematical literacy amongst our students, all right? There are many ways, but I choose to focus on one of the most important ways, and that is the mathematical work we engage our students to do in the classroom. And this must go beyond the mere recall of mathematical facts and their routine standard applications. I think just now you also heard from Professor Totok, two examples he gave us in his lecture. The first example is arranging some numbers in order. I'm not sure from small to big or big to small, but one was a fraction, one is a decimal, and then, you know, that kind of question is not focused on mathematical literacy because some standard routines that students learn in the classroom can be used to answer that question, all right? But the second question he used, which was something in a context, and you had to use the information in the context to make a decision, that is based on mathematical literacy because you will use your mathematical knowledge and work with the information given to arrive at your answer. All right, so I want to share with you several examples today that I have been very instrumental in actually getting a lot of my teachers to work around these ideas in their classrooms, in our schools. And don't forget, this is not something we started doing yesterday. This is something that we started doing in the year 2000. We only participated in PISA in 2009. Singapore participated in PISA for the first time in 2009. But even before that, we had the vision that in order for our students to become global citizens and be able to contribute towards a knowledge building society, the teaching and learning of maths in the classroom had to change significantly, all right? So let's look at the first example, all right? Now, um, when this kind of a question is often given to our students, the first reaction is always, oh, teacher, you didn't teach me about street light, okay? And now you ask me what is the possible height of a street light. Um, well, there's a lot of debate that always goes on, but this is a mathematical question, all right? And this question actually looks at your ability and makes an assessment whether you are mathematically literate or not. Can you actually look at the difference between seven centimeters, 70 centimeters, seven meters and 70 meters. Yeah, that is All right, so it's a very simple question. In our primary grades, grade one to four is common. We also used our coins, the Singapore $1 coin, five cent coin. And then we asked the students, which coin will use more metal to make? The heavier the coin, the more metal you need. The larger the diameter, the more metal you need. You know what I mean? So these questions are not questions that require them to do a lot of working, but they have to link up with mathematical ideas and think about it, all right? So this is one of our very simple questions. Now, the next one I want to share with you is, all right, now, we are very good at giving students a question to do and asking them to find something, all right? Uh, will they ever actually have a little passage like that in mathematics where the numbers are not put in the correct places for them? 
but they have to make sense of these numbers. All right. Now, if they are not mathematically literate and they, they cannot make sense about how these numbers are related to each other, they will not be able to do this successfully. All right. I think earlier on in Dr. Tok's, uh, Professor Tok's slides, he also talked about how students learn. Do they learn individually? Do they learn in groups? Do they work collaboratively? This is where we come in and students actually have to work collaboratively. All right. They have to work with each other. They have to argue and make sure that they can convince their friends that their answer is correct. So they, they, there's a party and I'm writing a little paragraph about a party. There were so many children at the party. Sally bought so many packets of sweets. And then there were so many sweets in one packet. During the party, she gave the sweets to each child. So how many sweets did she give the child? Because she had none left. All right, so what are we going to do? You want to try this? Yes. Yes. Who, who, were, wants, who wants to try? Were, yeah, there were 80 children at the party. 80 children? Yes. Okay. So? And Sally, and Sally bought uh, five packets of sweets. Mm -hmm. There were uh, 32 sweets in each packet. Mm -hmm. And during the party, she gave two sweets to each child and had no lab. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's not, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Never mind, you can try yeah. later when I send you the slide. Let's look at the next one. Okay, that is for a younger class. This is for older class. Uh, Rani made a triangular poster for the coming math competition. It was in the shape of an equilateral triangle. Site 30 cm. Her teacher liked the poster. She asked Rani to make another poster, but with an area twice that of the first poster. So Rani started making the poster and she says, okay, one side is 30 cm. I want to make the area twice, so I multiply each side by two, so my new poster will have a side of 60 centimeters. We tell the student there is something wrong with Rani's thinking, but some teachers like to change this sentence and ask the class, is Rani correct or wrong? And, you know, and start the discussion. And uh, so they have to go through the whole process of actually uh, comparing two similar figures, two similar figures, and you know the area of one figure and the next figure, you know one side, but you don't know the other side, how do you find? Or you can use what Rani has done and then you can find that the area is not twice. The area will be four times. So what do you do? You see, in this kind of questions, you find that the scaffolding is not in the question. The scaffolding is with the teacher. The teacher can give the scaffolding when the students need it badly. But the teacher can also hold back the scaffolding. That's very important because in a typical textbook question, the scaffolding is there. The scaffolding is there. And some questions in textbooks are very heavily scaffolded. When they are more heavily scaffolded, they actually deprive the students of more thinking. We teach students graphs. 
they can draw the graphs because we teach them how to draw a graph. We ask them to read the graph. They can read the graph. Okay. And then the job is done. We never go beyond it. So if you want to make sure your child is mathematically literate, they must be able to, they must be able to what? Interpret the mathematics in this graph and put a context to it, all right? So we give the students four graphs, A, B, C, and D. So some students, you know, they will say, when they look at graph A, they will say the boy started climbing up the hill. When he got to the top of the hill, he slept. And then he started coming down the hill. If you look at the research done on graphs, this is a very common misconception. They do not understand the relationship between the distance and the time on the graph. Okay, they are not able to see that when the distance remains the same and the time keeps going on, it shows that somebody is stationary at a point away from the starting point. And the slopes of the, of the lines, what does the steeper slope mean compared to a more gradual slope? So every teacher who teach graphs to students in grade six, seven, eight, when they finish the lessons on graphs, we push our teachers to make this the end point. They must be able to read such graphs. They must be able to interpret such graphs. So let's look at what some students will say. A, graph A. So Ali ran from his house to the bus stop, waited for his friend who did not turn up, so he went back home, but this time he walked home. So what's the difference between running and walking? When he ran, he took a shorter time to reach the same distance from home to bus stop. When he was walking home, he covered the same distance in a longer span of time. One, two. How long did Ali wait at the bus stop for his friend? You can see from the graph. So you can make sense of it. Okay. Now the second graph. Any child who knows how to read a graph carefully will tell you that in this graph, you are telling me at the same time, the same person is at two places. Can you see the vertical line? The vertical line? Your distance from home at the same time is at two points. So the child should be able to tell you this graph is incorrect. How can city be in two places at the same time? In mathematics, it is very common if we follow the textbooks and if we follow our own set pedagogies to give students questions to do that always will have an answer. There is no opportunity for the students to tell you that this question is cannot be done or this graph is incorrect. Now, if you want to nurture mathematically literate students, such opportunities should arise because they are now decision makers. They have to make a decision. It doesn't mean because you ask me to find something, I must always be able to find. If I don't have all the information in the given question, I may not be able to find. I don't know how many of you know this famous question that was used many years ago on very young kids. They were told that there is a ship 
you know, sailing in the harbour. Uh, and on this ship, uh, there were so many, there were some animals, some cows, some chickens, some ducks, you know, and some sheep. And the question was, what is the age of the ship's captain? Almost in every country the students participated from, they found an answer. What they did to the numbers was, they added, they subtracted, they multiplied, they divided, they did everything to get an answer, which was between 40 and 50. So when they were asked, why, why is this your answer? They said the ship's captain cannot be very old. The ship's captain cannot be very young. Now, that is a nonsensical question. But the students all found an answer. Why do you think they did this? Because we teachers, when we give our students a question to do, they must always find an answer for us. Okay? So, we need to kind of look at ourselves and change ourselves so that our students become more mathematically literate. I think, uh, you know, if Professor Toto is listening to my lecture, he will probably turn around and tell all the teachers in Indonesia, uh, the problem is we teachers, not the students. All right? Which I in Singapore also believe in. The students are very malleable. We can shape their thinking. We can get them to do wonderful things. But only if we give them the opportunity to do. Okay? So let's look at my, at my other two graphs. All right. So what happens in graph C? You start from home. You get somewhere. You come back to home. And then you go again. All right. So... Rosie went for a walk with some friends. She suddenly realized she had left her purse at home. So she ran home. Then she ran again to catch up with her friends. The last one. Not much action. Just one straight line. But the distance is far from home. So Amin must started walking from school to home. Okay, there are many such resources available, don't worry. If you're thinking that, oh, these are difficult resources to get, that's not true. These resources are very easily available, all right? Now let's look at another one. We teach our students how to find uh, volume, surface area. We teach them how to do a lot of things. But do we give them sometimes a piece of paper and we tell them, okay, if you roll, you, if you roll the paper, you can actually form cylinder A or cylinder B. Okay. Cylinder A, cylinder B, which one has more volume? Can they, will they apply the formulae they know? Yes, they will apply. Can they make a guess first? If they're going to make a guess, they must know the relationship. Volume of a cylinder is what? Pi radius squared times height. Which value is squared? The radius. So if you want a larger volume, make sure you have a larger radius, right? Because when you square a large value, it gets larger. I don't have to do the working. I can just predict. After I predict, I verify with my working. Okay, now next part. Now the sheet is cut into two equal parts, X and Y. Would the sum of the volumes of these two small cylinders be greater than the volume of cylinder B?
a typical question that you give students after teaching them the volumes of cylinders, pyramids, cones, and all that is find the area, find the volume, pour the water, take out the water, and you carry on and on and on. You do not engage them in some sustained work with the same task. Here you find that in this question, you're still working with the same cylinder B in part B also. And cylinder A and B also have a relationship because the relationship of cylinder A and B, they both have the same curved surface area. We teach probability. We have many, many questions on throw the dice and then find the probability of getting two and three on the faces of the two dice and we carry on and on and on. The students know probability. They can find the probability of an event, but they will never be able to make decisions about gaming. So I'm giving them this game, give to my students this game. There are two dice, they will roll the dice, they will work out the difference. And then if they get one, zero, one or two, they will move one space to the left. If they get a difference of three, four or five, they will move one space towards the right. If they play this game 20 times, they will record how many times they win, how many times they lose. So if every two people in the class play this game 20 times, you have 40 students, you can use an Excel sheet to collect all the number of wins and number of losers for 400 tries. And after that, the whole class can look at the outcome. You know that the theoretical probability of a fair game to either win or lose should tend to half. But in this case, it is not going to be that. One side is more probable than the other side. It is one third and two thirds. So your students have to discover that. After discovering that, you ask them to make a fair game. So what do they do? They have to rewrite. They have to rewrite the rules. They have to rewrite the rules. And in rewriting the rules, they have to come up with the sample space. And they have to make sure that they group events in such a way together in two groups that will give you the probability of half on either side. So this is a game we will use most of the time in my class with my teachers when we are doing probability. Not when I start teaching probability, but when I'm finishing teaching probability. Because every topic, every uh, strand of work we do, the end point must be what? They must go into higher order thinking. They must exhibit literacy, the ability to understand the mathematics and use it in any context that is given to them. Are you, are you all right? Or is there too much maths to do? This is a Saturday morning. 
It's quite good to do maths on a Saturday morning. Hey, okay. yeah. huh? too much maths or what? No, no, I think it's no, good. no. Okay, then let me show you some. Uh, this is our national examination questions yeah. for grade six. Grade six, huh? So, decision making. You're given a context. Look at, let's look at the first question. There's a recycling project. Ali collected 17 bottles. Bala collected 2M. And Carl collected 2 plus M. Okay. So, which statement is true, false, or not possible to tell? Ali collected the most number of bottles. Ali collected 17. Bala collected 2M. Carl collected 2 plus M. Can I say that Ali collected the most number of bottles? What is M if M is equal to 10? Then what happens? Bala will have 20, right? Bala will have 20, Carl will have 12. So will Ali collect the most? Okay, next question. Bala collected more bottles than Carl. Is 2M always greater than 2 plus M? What if M is equal to 2? 2 times 2 is the same as 2 plus 2. The three boys collected 3M plus 19 bottles all together. Hmm? What? Is it okay now? 3M plus 19. Algebraic simplification. True. Uh, of course, Claire. <laughs> has to be true because it's algebra. We just add the numbers and the alphabets. And... Okay. So now when we talk about, okay, we talk about mathematical literacy. Nobody tells you that this question is on algebra or this question is on numbers. You know what I mean? Nobody asks you to, um, what do you call that, evaluate. Nobody told you M is something evaluate to M. You know, M is something evaluate to plus M. No, but nobody tells you that. Okay, but this is a context. It's a context. All right. In this context, the number of bottles they collect are represented are given in a mathematically representative way. So, can you make sense of it? Imagine this is our grade six, huh? primary six, grade six. All right, so next question. Two numbers add up to 415. If one of them is a two-digit number and the other is a three-digit number, two numbers, they must add up to 415. One is a two-digit number and the other is a three-digit number. What is the smallest possible difference between the two numbers? Higher order thinking. Just tell you that the sum is 415. One number is three-digit, the other number is two-digit. So one number can be 400, the other number can be 15. Correct? But the difference between the two numbers must be the smallest. 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 So you have to do it. Then you look at the third question. The average of three different two-digit numbers is 25. All the numbers are two-digit, no? Huh? The average is 25. One of the three numbers 
of the three numbers, find the largest possible number. Average of the three two-digit numbers is 25. So the total of the three numbers is 75. Right? Of the three numbers, find the largest possible number. Which is the smallest two-digit number? 10. Right? Smallest two-digit number is 10. They didn't say the three-digit numbers must be different. So you can have 10, 10, and what? 55. Okay. So this is again high order thinking. Enjoy them. Are they fun? Okay, let's go to another one. Okay, now, now I'm taking this question from PISA 2021. I think just now Professor Totok said that uh, the next PISA outcome is PISA 2022. This is one of the sample questions used in PISA 2021. Okay, so um, let's look at what they say. Always, sometimes, never. Okay, so they first, you, you don't look at the you don't look at the left side of the screen. Huh? Don't look at the, just look at the right side of the screen. Don't look at the left side, okay? Uh, I put two, two slides into one, okay? So just look at the right side, okay? Uh, they first tell the child that statements that people make can generally be grouped into three different categories. Statements that are always true, statements that are sometimes true, and statements that are never true. So when is a statement always true? They give you an example that four is divisible by two. It is always true. Uh, a statement that is sometimes true. Uh, a number that is divisible by nine is also divisible by six. Well, if you have 36, then this is true. But if you have uh, 27, then it may not be true. Okay? Now, the third one is uh, never true. All right? Uh, the sum of two odd numbers is odd. Oh, can never happen. So it is never true. So this is, they teach the child first how to understand always true, sometimes true, never true. If you look back at our, our wait, no, let's go back to the, okay. If you look back at our grade six questions, quite similar, the thinking, right? Quite similar thinking, okay? All right, now the question here is on the left side of the panel. Look at the left side of the panel. Huh? Okay. A 14-year-old girl was at least once in her lifetime half her current height. So maybe the 14-year-old girl is now 1.2 meters. Okay. So was she before that 600 centimeters in her lifetime? Was that her height some time ago? Definitely, right? Because it is a continuous line, right? Your height as you grow can be represented by a continuous line. Now the next question. A 14-year-old girl is taller than a 10-year-old girl. Sometimes too. Yeah, sometimes lah. Not always, right? Because... I mean, some of us have got tall parents. We are very tall. Some of us have shorter parents. We are short. You may be same age, but different height. Or you may be different in, in years, but yet you may be shorter. I may be 14 years old, but still shorter than my 10-year-old friend. Isn't it? Okay, so this is what we mean by what? Mathematical literacy. Mathematical literacy. You see, the problem with our students in our classrooms is they are very used to doing maths, doing, doing, must multiply, must divide, must take away, you know, must do, or must use formula, must find this, you know. So when we give them such questions, they are like, huh, is this mathematics? Yes, it is mathematics. 
And this is what you mean by mathematics in a wider context. The context can be anything. Are you able to think mathematically? Are you able to apply your concepts of measurement? All right, this question continues because this is question 1-3. Then you have question 2-3. Okay, there are more statements, all right? When a whole number is multiplied by itself, the answer is even. Any whole number, when you multiply it by itself, the answer is even. Sometimes true. So the child can use examples, right? He can say, okay, if my whole number is one, one times one, what do I get? If my whole number is two, what do I get? Two times two. If my whole number is three, you know? He will go on. This is what me, what you mean by the child must be able to generate his own examples to test and verify. Okay. Now, doubling a whole number produces an even number. Doubling means what? You multiply by two. Any number multiplied by two will give you an even number. Two times one is two. Two times three is six. And you go on. All right. Now, next one. Half you half an odd number produces a whole number. If you half an odd number, an odd number can be three, right? If you half three, do you get a whole number? You see, you're supposed to think. Okay. Now, next one, they give you an algebraic form. 3x plus 1. Is it the same as 6x plus 2 divided by 2? So that is an algebraic form. And the next one is measurement. The perimeter of figure A is greater than the perimeter of figure B. They're actually the same, you know. You can move up the line. You can move up and move out. The perimeters are the same. We do a lot of this work in grade four, five. We have composite figures. The children must find the perimeter. And the last one here is, if I flip a coin 50 times, it will land heads up 25 times. This is theoretical probability, right? You think 50 times is good enough? If I flip the coin 50 times, it will land hits up 25 times. That means the probability of hits is half. The probability of tail must also be half, right? But is 50 times enough to no. show that the theoretical probability is half? Because they say n tends to infinity, right? 50 may not be good enough, right? So sometimes, sometimes true, right? Okay, one more. All right. This one is the last of the three. You have a statement, okay? The statement is the person with the largest number of coins has the largest amount of money. Give an example when the statement is true. Give another example when the statement is not true. You have 100 coins, but every coin is 10 cents. Or you could have only 50 coins, but every coin is $1. So the child must be able to look at different examples and make this, fit them in the different criteria. A minus B is equal to B minus A. When is this statement true? A minus B is equal to B minus A. When A is equal to B, la. right? I mean, the student must come up with examples. Example when the statement is not true. When A is greater than B, then one side you have a positive number, the other side you have a negative number, right? Then it cannot be true. 
the last one, if you add the same number to the numerator and the denominator of a fraction, the fraction value increases. Have you done enough mathematics on a Saturday morning? I, I explained to you why I wanted to share these examples with you. Now, these examples are not difficult examples for us educators and teachers to come up with for use in our classrooms. They are not. It's just that we either are not familiar with them or we don't value them, okay? In some cases, some people will even think these are trivial. But I would disagree with people who think these are trivial. I think these are actually very thought-provoking kind of things we can get students to do, all right? And better still, if we can give them things to do in class after a certain topic, where the answer depends on different conditions. It can be always true, never true, sometimes true, so that we can widen their scope of thinking and looking at the context more carefully. So this is my very small contribution to the debate we have today on mathematical literacy. I can hand back the uh, hold on. Uh, let me take a picture of the screen because that is important. I want to see everybody on the screen. <laughs> I can hand back the, the screen to uh, stop share. Okay, stop share. Okay, I can hand back the screen to the uh, host of the, the session. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Kaur. This is a uh... Mathematics on the Saturday morning. Yeah, this is uh, this, uh, quite uh, interesting and thank you very much. And yeah, this is a wonderful presentation and uh, it's very important for us. And there is many things we can learn from you and from your explanation. And yeah, uh, there's also uh, some of the example of the mathematical literacy. Class. And yeah, uh, before we start for the discussion, I will give the short uh, resume for the uh, your talk to the audience, Bapak Ibu, mungkin ini sekilas tentang apa yang disampaikan Prof. Kaur, tentang proyek tentang literasi matematis yang dilakukan Prof. Kaur, bukanlah ya proyek yang kemarin sore ya, jadi sudah tadi disampaikan, melainkan proyek yang sudah berjalan lama, sekitar dua bulan tahun, dan definisi literasi matematika, literasi dalam PISA bukan hanya tentang menggunakan fakta dalam matematika, tapi juga tentang menggunakan matematika dalam pemecahan masalah, dan contoh-contoh penelaran diberikan Prof. Kaur tadi, dan menunjukkan soal-soal yang kadang tidak diajarkan oleh uh, guru di kelas, gitu, Bapak Ibu. Dan soal yang diberikan kadang mudah dan dengan desain soal yang membuat siswa melakukan penalaran matematis dan mengharuskan uh, mereka mengaitkan soal dengan konsep matematika yang dipelajari. Jadi Profesor Kau percaya bahwa masalah utama yang harus dipecahkan adalah tentang kualitas guru kurang lebih. Jadi itu sesuatu teacher quality, this is uh, also uh, with the statement of from the Profesor. Uh, Mr. Totok, this is also the quality of the teacher is uh, to solve this problem. Yeah, okay, thank you, Professor uh, Carl. There is uh, three questions from the uh, participant. There is a uh, different in Indonesia, but we already translate. And the first question is come from the Greg Nugroho from STPEP Malang. The question is, uh, how do Singapore unit the, uh, the reform of mathematic education policies and enhanced teacher, curricular quality, etc., and by both public and relevant government agencies to answer the uh, longer term better achievement in education. Yeah, this is about the host Singapore reform of mathematics education. Uh, perhaps you can directly to answer the question. Can, 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 you, can you 
Repeat the question. Okay. Tampilkan aja um, Pak Anu. Yeah. Okay, I will share the. Share the slide, yes. Yes. Okay, this is the first question from Greg uh, Nukroho. Is that Greg Nukroho? Uh, how do Singapore unite? Sorry, from Oh, okay, okay, okay. How do Singapore unite? Okay. Um, we have a curriculum review every uh, used to be ten years, but now it is shorter, shorter cycle, uh, six years or so. Uh, so the curriculum review is not actually a drastic change. It is always refinements in uh, ways we do things. All right. So um, when you talk about uh, public and relevant government agencies, the government agencies here would be the Ministry of Education, the uh, National Institute of Education and the schools. Now, the three of us work hand in hand, all right? So there is no tension there, all right? So uh, we actually have the ministry and colleagues from NIE sitting on the review committees of the school maths curriculum, all right? And once the curriculum uh, has been reviewed and for the next uh, six or eight years, whatever the plan is, the uh, reform is rolled out very systematically to the schools through the ministry curriculum planning department for mathematics, all right? Now, the public uh, do not play a big role in this, all right? Uh, the public would be more significant when the assessment changes. All right, if there are very drastic changes in assessment, that's when the public actually gets alarmed. So we find that uh, so far, unlike uh, I've seen in other countries where the public actually becomes a big uh, factor, for us in Singapore, it is not a big factor because uh, you find that the, in fact, uh, like I think what Professor Totok said, it's not only maths, it is science, it's language. Uh, the reform sometimes cut across everything. You know, when you say students should be literate in science, scientific knowledge, mathematical knowledge, uh, whatever other humanities knowledge. So the literacy is not only for mathematics, but it's also cutting across the other subjects. And how we do for mathematics will be very, dependent on the thinking of the maths people and the ministry maths uh, colleagues and the NIE people who work together. And uh, I think some of your Indonesian uh, colleagues also know that we have an annual mathematics teacher conference here in Singapore in the Institute where about nearly 800 teachers come together every year to listen to the latest of mathematics education and how we can actually uh, implement change in our classrooms, you see. So you find that um, we don't have uh, this unity, I would say. I would say we are united because uh, I think the other thing which people don't seem to understand is in Singapore, we don't have any natural resources. Like Indonesia, you may have a lot of, you know, uh, timber or you may have oil or you may have fishery or you may have other industries. Uh, in Singapore, human beings are our only resource. If our students and our school leavers, especially as measured by PISA at the age of 15, you know, that is the, the group of students who are going to leave compulsory education, don't have the, the, the skills and the competencies for the future, they will not be able to be, you know, uh, valued people in the workforce. So uh, that is my answer to your question. Uh, did the teachers give the mentioned questions in the class? Uh, yes, I've been working with my teachers. Yes, these questions are quite common in our classrooms. Yes. Yeah. And during the pandemic, there is no physical interaction. Oh, yes, that is a big problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we have home-based learning. But um, 
Is there any strategy to increase mathematics literacy without any physical interaction? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, in home-based learning, in Zoom, they create classrooms uh, for students to work in smaller groups, discuss, and then they come back to the whole group and then students can actually uh, put the slide and show their, their answer and there's some discussion which will take place. But uh, I would say that the, in home-based learning, we are still grappling to fine tune which are the best modalities. Uh, teachers have had more stress. Uh, teachers have also said that they are able to do much less than in the physical space of the classroom. Uh, but uh, there is no short changing in terms of literacy. Uh, I think here we have to understand this word mathematics literacy very carefully. Um, we are not going to make it an option. Oh, if I don't have time, I don't do. No. It is part and parcel of what I do all the time. You see? So it, it cannot be like, okay, in home-based learning, I got no time, so I don't do. No, I can still give them five questions to do, but the last question will have mathematical literacy. All right? Okay, you look at the question on the, 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 the equilateral triangle poster that I showed you just now. Okay? So the site is 30 cm. I want to make a new poster besides uh, twice the area. What is the site? Even if students are not physically interacting in class and discussing and all that, just through the solution the child gives you, you can see what is the thinking of the child. All right. And I think just now Professor Toto talked about feedback. Okay. And he refers to Professor Hattie's work. All right. Now, um, Feedback is actually very powerful, okay? Uh, and feedback has to be given at the right time to the students to make sure that we harness on their misconceptions. And that is when I think face-to-face -face learning has the biggest advantage, all right? So for us in our classrooms, uh, a lot of work that students, even if they do at home, when they are back into the classroom, the questions that the teacher wants to discuss are taken to the front in the subsequent lesson and discussed. All right. So two questions. Finish? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you somebody so asked. Yeah. Somebody asked me the yeah. question about Singapore textbooks. I read somewhere. Oh yeah. I know a lot of schools in Jakarta are using Singapore textbooks. But the textbook, don't forget, uh, the textbook is only a textbook. The textbook cannot replace the teacher. All right. So the how the teacher orchestrate the task is very important. Because in mathematical literacy, you will find out that it's not about writing answers to questions. It is about thinking. You saw all the, all the example of questions I showed you. Was there much writing to do? Not much. There were decisions to make and examples to bring. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the uh, answer, Professor Kaus. And there is a lot of the question, but uh, I think we have uh, not a lot of time for discussion today because uh, we'll also hear from the professor Tulkarsi to uh, talk about yes. Indonesia. And, but uh, perhaps uh, before we continue to the, uh, the next uh, presentation, Professor Sukestiarno, perhaps uh, you would like to uh, ask some question or give the comment to Professor Kaur directly, please. Uh, we will. Yeah. I, no, yeah, I, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation with the example of TAS, Professor Kaur. And we all know that you are very expert in the PISA, also in the teaching. I remember in 2016, you were the keynote speaker in the ICMI in Hamburg. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, speaker. Thank you very much now. Um, Maybe you can also now leave after because we still have one session left. 
uh, of course, we are going to have communication by email. Thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kaltu. And yeah, thank you very much for your time and the valuable skills for us, Professor Kaltu. We can learn from you and also from the Singapore about the, about the improve the uh, PISA in Indonesia, especially we have a lot of problem and uh, hopefully we'll continue to discuss and learn from the UN. And we can see you next time, not in online, but also in uh, uh, yes, yes. Semarang or in the Palembang uh, next okay. time. Okay. Thank we, you. Uh, we visit, uh, uh, visit in East Semarang is uh, Mr. Tahtin Lam, uh, give the uh, talk in 2018. And yeah, hopefully the next uh, you can visit in Semarang and also in several countries because the uh, participants is come from the Aceh and the Papua just come here and then there is uh, a lot of the participants joining the Zoom meeting and also joining the YouTube uh, streaming. Yeah, this is uh, uh, so thank you very much for, for you and yeah, we hope you will continue to join us. Uh, but if you have other activities, we can uh, you can leave this. Uh, no, I will I will join you. I will join you. Oh, yes. 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 Thank you very much. And perhaps there is uh, some other questions that we can uh, discuss uh, uh, with you, Professor. And then for the next, uh, we'll give the time for the, our second speaker, Professor Zulkardi. From the, yeah, yeah, I will share the screen. Okay, this is uh, the curriculum vitae, of, short curriculum vitae of the professor uh, Yogati. Uh, he is a professor of mathematical education at the uh, Universitas Sriwijaya. Uh, he's a head of the doctoral program and one of the leading figures of the Indonesian realistic mathematical education and also mathematical literacy in Indonesia and also uh, he's the editor in chief of Journal on Mathematical Education. He's the uh, quartil to in the schema group yeah, and index in Scopus and this is a uh, uh, funny uh, great uh, journal in Indonesia and yeah today Professor Lukati will talk about the uh, PISA shock in Indonesia when uh, the first uh, yeah the term of PISA shock remains smith of going to back in 2001 I think this is when the first PISA results they are very used and then the reaction of Germany that is not uh, referred to the as a PISA shock I think Totally about Prof. Zilkardi. And, and this is interesting to talk about the PISA shock in Indonesia. And yeah, Prof. Zilkardi, you have uh, time to about 13 minutes to talk. And then we have the 10 minutes for the question and answer. So now the floor is your Prof. Zilkardi. Ongo silakan, Pak Zilkardi. Okay, terima kasih, Pak Edi. Uh, <coughs> I try to share screen. Share. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> Sinan uh, Professor Kaur, I will talk in Bahasa. It's okay. Yes, uh, I really appreciate about your presentation. Uh, I'm talking about PISA SOC in Indonesia. Um, <clears throat> we start with uh, siapa and mengapa PISA SOC. Saha, satu tim PMRI, salah satu contoh, one of airport in Indonesia to improve PISA. And AKM is a now it's a new issue, assessment competency minimum. Yeah. Ini perubahan dari ujian nasional, literasi, numerasi. Ini ada contoh soal dan konteks. Karena bagaimanapun, pembelajaran untuk mendapatkan soal yang menggunakan penalaran atau reasoning butuh konteks. Mungkin kita diskusi. Ya, kalau bicara bisa sok, kita ingat bisa 2000 yang pertama kali negara Jerman sok karena nilai mereka rendah di bawah rata-rata dan juga di bawah negara tetangga. Karena mereka negara kaya dan negara maju, pembuat mobil Mercedes. Ya. Akhirnya mereka berpikir untuk mengubah atau melakukan perubahan di uh, early childhood education, jadi di pendidikan dasar dan ke bawah ya. Efeknya 2009, nilai PISA naik, ya. kemudian juga sampai sekarang juga nilai PISA mereka, skor PISA mereka bagus. Dan intinya apa sih perubahan? Salah satunya kalau kembali matematika, kontennya itu mereka mengarahkan ke 
pembelajaran yang mengarahkan ke pemodelan, reasoning, ya. jadi tidak hanya fact and, dan rumus-rumus gitu. Ya. Kemudian kalau kita bicara dengan skor PISA Indonesia, ini dari 2000 kita ikut, ketika Jerman stock kita juga ikut, dan bahkan nilai kita paling bawah untuk masyarakat. Nah, tapi apakah kita shock? Tidak tidak terlalu shock gitu ya. Karena pada saat itu kita baru ada kejadian 1998 negara kita berusaha untuk perbaikan di segala bidang. Nah, tiga tahun terakhir ini nilainya ada penaikan jadi naik turun naik turun tidak stabil tapi terakhir turun semua. Bisa 2018 turun semua baik matematik, sains dan membaca. Nah, di sini sebenarnya saya lihat shock yang terjadi agak lebih besar dari yang dulu-dulu. Kita lihat. Kira-kira shock pertama dari Menteri <coughs> Pak Nuh tahun 2014, hasil PISA kita rendah sekali, hasil PISA 2013 seperti itu. Akhirnya ada kebijakan soal PISA di inclus, disisipkan di ujian nasional. Dan pada tahun itu, Ada dua soal yang disisipkan. Salah satunya soal yang dianggap oleh masyarakat di Kompas dianggap jiplak karena memang mirip PISA sehingga terjadi debat. Tapi akhirnya Menikbud mengatakan bahwa tidak ada. Kita mengadopsi artinya kita mengambil soal karena kita anggota OECD mitranya tentu kita tidak plagiat. Jadi soalnya tentang kita goras dan satu lagi tentang rata-rata. Itu sok pertama dengan memasukkan dua soal. ke-40 soal PISA, dan juga mulai revisi kurikulum. Kemudian, Menteri berikutnya, Pak Anies Baswedan, ada reformasi sedikit masalah meningkatkan nilai literasi, ya. literasi matematik, literasi membaca, ya. dan literasi sains. Adalah gerakan literasi sekolah. Jadi, anak-anak ada peraturannya, peraturan presiden sebelum belajar itu harus membaca dulu. Ya. membaca yang apa itu tergantung dari kesiapan sekolahnya. Tapi ini juga menarik dan juga efeknya bahwa anak mulai rajin membaca. Ini juga efek dari PISA shock ya, karena juga mereka mendasarkan tentang PISA. Hasilnya itu berdasarkan dari skor PISA tadi. Nah, kemudian tahun 2018 Pak Muhajir soal-soal PISA lebih banyak dimasukkan. Sehingga Ini apa tingkat kesulitan soal pisanya jauh lebih tinggi dan ini pada saat itu 2018 banyak yang komplain siswanya melalui sosial media yang mulai saat itu sosial media sudah mulai langsung ke menteri mereka bilang bahwa kenapa soal terlalu sulit kenapa tidak sama dengan kisi-kisi kenapa enggak yang sama dengan diajarkan guru di kelas. Nah, Menteri karena bijaksana dia minta maaf atas nama pemerintah, nama guru. Karena ini memang sengaja untuk ditingkatkan ke level yang high order thinking. Jadi kita supaya sama dengan negara-negara lain soal-soal itu kita gunakan soal-soal yang memang berkaitan atau dipakai dalam kehidupan di masyarakat. Bahkan dia mengatakan bahwa mulai tahun 2019 bisa dijadikan standar internasional pendidikan di Indonesia. Dan soal-soal akan tambah sulit, artinya menggunakan soal-soal hot dan penalaran seperti tadi yang disampaikan oleh Profesor Kaur ya. Banyak sekali soal-soal yang menggunakan reasoning, yang butuh pemikiran, tidak bisa langsung dijawab. Nah, Menteri berganti lagi, kita lihat lagi apa action-nya, efek dari shock tadi. Pas Menteri Baru langsung pengumuman hasil PISA 2018, yaitu tanggal 3 Desember 2019. Karena PISA ini selalu diumumkan setahun sebelum dan minggu pertama bulan Desember. Hasilnya yang tadi, yang pertama, parah. Semuanya turun. Tapi Menteri Mas Nadim ini orangnya juga pintar. Dia bilang, wah kita nggak ada masalah dengan nilai. Kita jadikan perspektif. Ya. Kita bersyukur, sama seperti Pak Toto bilang tadi, kita bersyukur akses sudah bagus gitu. Negara kita besar, ya, akses sudah bagus. Kalau dibandingkan dengan Singapura, memang jauh. Jadi akses bagus pun sudah bersyukur kita. Masalah nilai, kita akan coba ubah. Ya. Dan saya lebih optimis dengan Menteri sekarang, karena ujian nasional itu diubahnya, digantinya menjadi asesmen kompetensi minimum. Ya. 
Kenapa begitu? Karena menurut pengamatan kita sejak 2 tahun 2000 ketika Profesor Jan Delang menyampaikan PISA di Konferensi Nasional Matematika di ITB awal PISA 2000 dia mengatakan bahwa PISA itu salah satu pembelajaran nanti yang sama dengan realistik matematik. Nah, di situ dikatakannya bahwa ya, pembelajaran itu harus berdasarkan konteks, harus berdasarkan konteks. Nah, ini ini menarik. Nah, kita kita lihat bahwa dengan dengan digantinya PISA, ya, apa uh, ujian nasional dengan AKM itu strategi atau trik dari Mas Menteri bahwa nanti soal-soal dari AKM ini mengarah ke soal-soal PISA. mengarah ke soal-soal PISA yang levelnya nanti lebih ke aplikatif dan penalaran. Sehingga secara tidak langsung, siswa kita akan belajar banyak menghadapi AKM, sama seperti mereka serius sekali menghadapi ujian nasional, sehingga otomatis nantinya diharapkan 2 tahun atau 5 tahun lagi soal PISA ini, akan, skor kita akan naik di PISA. Karena semangat anak belajar PISA sama dengan semangat untuk ujian nasional atau AKM. Kemudian, Ada strategi oleh Menteri disampaikan baru-baru ini ya, Jumat 3 April 2020 dengan Presiden pada rapat terbatas. Ini juga menarik bahwa dulu PISA itu hanya dikelola di tempatnya Pak e, Totok tadi oleh satu subunit kecil gitu. Sekarang PISA ini jadi pemberitaan atau menjadi fokus dari bahkan Presiden pun bicara tentang PISA. Ya. Menteri dan juga Menteri Keuangan ya. Nah salah satu lima strategi untuk meningkatkan skor PISA kata Pak Nadim, yaitu UN diganti dengan KAKM tadi dan numerasi berbasis global ya. Nanti tetap dijadikan dan terus untuk bahasa dijadikan standar pembelajaran sehingga kita sama dengan negara-negara lain. Nah sebenarnya. Setahu saya di Kemdikbud juga sudah ada program namanya Aksi. Ini adalah PISA versi Indonesia, di mana soal-soal PISA sudah diadaptasi sedikit lupa. Ini Aksi singkatan dari Asesmen Kompetensi Siswa Indonesia. ya. Nah, selain PISA sebenarnya ada juga PIAK. PIAK ini PISA untuk orang dewasa. ya. Ini juga menarik karena diujikan tahun 2015, hasilnya tahun 2016, di kota besar kalau Indonesia, yaitu di Jakarta. Menariknya untuk literasi dan numerasi sama. Negara yang tinggi itu Jepang, Finlandia, dan Belanda, dan Swedia. Dan yang paling rendah itu Jakarta. Gitu. Jadi, pegawai-pegawai yang di Jakarta sebenarnya mencerminkan tingginya level pegawai di seluruh Indonesia, itu pun nilainya paling rendah. baik literasi maupun numerasi. Apalagi mungkin yang di Palembang ya, atau di Semarang. Ini juga jadi pemikiran kita bahwa bukan hanya anak usia 15 kemampuan literasi numerasi kita lemah, tapi juga di level pekerja yang diujikan oleh pihak. Ini menariknya pihak ini. Itu kira-kira uh, update dari itu. Kemudian saya menc- mencontohkan uh, usaha untuk mendirikan visa yang kami coba dari, dari kelompok PMRI sedikit bahwa tahun 2000 Jan Delang Ketua Expert Matematik PISA OECD dan Direktur Perorental Institute telah bicara di Konferensi Nasional Matematika tahun 2000 di ITB bahwa PISA akan sebentar lagi ditampilkan waktu tahun 2000 jadi silakan untuk belajar bagaimana PISA dilanjuti oleh Pasili Jalal di Seminar Nasional waktu itu saya undang di UNSRI, dia juga bicara tentang PISA, Pak Pasli kemudian Di Konferensi Nasional Matematika di Manado, saya bicara sebagai kinut tentang PISA, KLM, dan juga uh, ujian nasional. Saya undang Profesor Satrio Sementri Brojonegoro waktu itu tentang PIAK, tentang PISA Adal di UNSRI, ya, dan dia bicara tentang itu. Kemudian tentu Pak Muhajir kemarin ada seminar internasional dengan Sekjen OECD tentang PISA. Mas Menteri juga ada seminar untuk pengumuman, dan hari ini Yang saya tahu ada profesor berbinder online Zoom tentang PISA. Tentu banyak lagi seminar-seminar yang lain tentang PISA, ini yang saya tahu saja. Dan ini sebagian yang saya tahu dan sebagian yang saya ikut membantu bagaimana pelaksananya konferensi ini. Ini beberapa usaha yang kita coba di UNSRI. Tahun 2010 saya sudah membuat kontes literasi matematik namanya 
di mana anak-anak kita ada kontes bagaimana menjelaskan secara reasoning tentang matematika yang soal-soalnya kita uh, ambil dari PISA atau adaptasi dari PISA. Ada juga websitenya di PISA Indonesia WordPress.com ya, Kalau kita ketik di Google kontes literasi matematika PISA banyak sekali poster-poster ya, yang ada ini gambar saya pas Ratu, Bu Ratu ya. ada yang di Semarang dan lain-lain juga ada di 20 kota besar di Indonesia mengadakan kontes ini sampai saat ini. Nah, ini yang saya bilang tentang pihak kemarin, Visa, yaitu ini Profesor Satria, mantan dirijen Dikti, di Palembang tahun 2016. Kalau masalah riset, ya, karena saya di LPTK juga 2010, di S2 maupun di S3 2016 ini, saya arahkan mereka riset di PMRI atau Visa. Kalau diketik saja di IOP, di proceeding, ya, karena kita memulai untuk scopus ini dari Ayok. Ketik saja visa atau julukan di visa, maka muncul tulisan-tulisan saya yang berkaitan dengan mahasiswa-mahasiswa saya yang berkaitan dengan visa. Misalnya mendesain visa like matematik di in Indonesia. Ya. Kemudian, kemudian juga masalah konteks Asian Game yang baru-baru ini ada di Palembang juga. ya. Kemudian juga konteks kota Jambi, bagaimana soal-soal yang berkaitan dengan kota Jambi itu. dipublish di jurnal di UNJ. Ini juga ada jurnal JMA. Ada Brinder Kaur juga menulis Selling Content in Pisa Like Mathematic Problems. Cash Stacy juga, Presiden OEC di Matematik juga menulis tentang Pisa ya. Dan banyak sekali uh, sitasinya ya. Nah, itu uh, usaha yang telah dilakukan baik uh, riset maupun seminar, seni lokal maupun pembelajaran ya tentunya. Nah, kalau tentang visa tentu sudah selesai, tapi ini penting. Ini yang sebenarnya tadi dimunculkan oleh Pak ya, Pak Toto terakhir ya, pada slide terakhir atau mengundi terakhir bahwa visa itu dimundurkan tahun 2022. Ini menarik, menarik apa supaya kita banyak lebih banyak waktu untuk mempersiapkan diri gitu. Nah, numerasi itu sebenarnya apa sih? Kalau kita lihat numerasi itu penalaran menggunakan matematika dalam menyelesaikan masalah dalam kehidupan sehari-hari. Jadi tadi Profesor Kaur bilang, dalam konteks apapun, penalaran ha, tetap dipakai. Dalam suasana COVID ini pun, tentu penalaran tetap digunakan. Jadi jangan lupa tetap menggunakan e, matematika literasi. Ya. Matematika literasi yang banyak nanti menggunakan pemikiran atau thinking matematik atau reasoning. Sedangkan literasi untuk memahami teks bacaan untuk mencapai masalah kontekstual. Secara nalar. Jadi membaca bukan hanya membaca saja, tapi menalar apa makna ini dari bacaan tadi. Bahkan kalau Pak Mendikbud bilang Indonesia krisis literasi, ya, ini, ini juga menarik kalau baca koran, ya, baca wartawan. Nah, framework PISA 2021 yang ada di OECD, fokusnya itu pada penalaran. Yang selama ini sebenarnya banyak pada pemodelan dan lain-lain, tapi di sini fokus pada penalaran. Ya, kita bersyukur ada contoh-contoh soal-soal yang tadi, ya, Soal yang mungkin tidak akan keluar, artinya soal yang dilepaskan atau dirilis oleh Profesor Kaur tadi, ya, ada beberapa contoh soal menarik, itu semuanya reasoning. Semuanya di reasoning. Ini menarik. Sebenarnya kemampuan ini yang dituntut oleh PISA, bukan hanya reasoning. Itu berpikir kritis, kreatif, ya, kemudian persisten, ya, akurat, kemudian sistem thinking, reflection, dan lain-lain. Kalau konteksnya tetap sama, kontennya juga tetap sama ya. bilangan, data, jabar, dan geometri. Prosesnya ini proses juga sama ya, mulai dari formulasi, dari soal cerita menjadi model matematik, kemudian dikerjakan, di-employ, dapat hasil matematika, hasilnya diinterpretasi lagi, dan evaluasi apakah cocok dengan soalnya ya. Itu framework. Nah dengan framework tadi jelas konteks, ya. ini tadi konteks personal, akupasional, sosial. Jadi kalau Ada yang banyak tanya ya waktu pendaftaran bagaimana membuat soal ya, bisa atau soal AKM ya bagaimana bentuknya saya kira salah satunya mulai dari konteks-konteks ini juga dan fokuslah kepada reasoning untuk setiap bahan ya kemudian arahkan untuk supaya mereka kreatif tadi dibilang oleh Profesor Kaur ya scaffoldingnya itu dikit saja bahkan tidak ada sehingga siswa kreatif untuk berpikir eh, multiple solusi nantinya muncul ya. Kalau semuanya sudah dikasih tahu, 
akhirnya hanya satu jawaban ya seperti Pak Toto soal pertama tadi itu. Nah, ini contoh konteks yang mungkin bisa dipakai kalau masa pandemi karena pandemi COVID ini adalah contoh konteks atau fenomena global di mana sebuah negara kena ya. Jadi kita bisa pakai dari sebagai konteks yang real real konteks. Ini saya ambil konteks dari data ya, dari data yang untuk melihat hasil COVID dari seluruh dunia ya, yang sudah ditaruh dalam jagaan lingkaran. Kelihatan sekali bahwa India, Brazil, Amerika ya, banyak sekali mereka sampai 20 Agustus dan Indonesia ada di sini 0,65 persen. Nah ini ini bisa dijadikan soal ya. Ini dengan jumlah ini berapa persen ya? Atau misalnya ini kan ditutup ditambah tambahi sebenarnya nggak kelihatan di sini. Negara-negara ASEAN yang lainnya. Konteks yang lain juga dari dari COVID tadi. Ya. Ini juga kalau ada jumlah dunia 22 juta yang kena Amerika 5, Brazil 3, dan Indonesia dan Filipina berdekatan. Filipina lebih banyak dari kita. Gitu. Lebih berdekatan. Ini juga bisa ditanya untuk negara-negara ASEAN. Yang merah ini yang meninggal. Ya. Di sini bisa ditanya apakah situasi sudah aman atau belum. Gitu. Bagaimana mengatasinya ya, dan lain-lain. Bisa ditanyakan. Ini juga konteks yang sangat menarik sebenarnya bahwa di Mekah kemarin itu area haji biasanya itu sampai dua setengah juta tiga juta tapi tahun ini tidak sampai seratus ribu gitu sehingga bisa dibandingkan nih ya, antara jumlah kuantitas yang dulu dengan yang sekarang kemudian ketika ada physical distancing atau jarak yang telah ditentukan tidak boleh berkerumun atau berdekatan minimal dua meter maka terjadi gambar ini gitu. nah ini bisa ditanyakan misalnya dari top dari atas, kira-kira apa bentuknya ya? Ini, ini contoh juga yang menarik bisa dijadikan soal. Bisa dijadikan. Kemudian ini juga soal COVID Indonesia yang kemarin muncul ya, selalu muncul begini. Perhatikan bahwa di sini bisa ditanya, ya, ini apa artinya ya? Dua dua enam Ini juga apa arti yang lain? Ini kan naik panagaan. Nah, ini bisa dijadikan soal. Ya. Apakah jumlah naik turun? Berapa persen perubahan kasus? Mengapa ya? Situasi sudah aman dan selainnya. Nah, ini juga bahkan di koran internasional New York juga muncul gambar seperti ini bahwa siswa itu trap inside seperti dalam akuarium tidak bisa keluar pas keluar ada virus. Ini kalau orang bahasa biasa saja menjadi tuliskan puisi dan sekian dari gambar. Misalnya. Ini juga kemarin semayang idul adha ya semua tempat duduk sudah dijarakkan ditempatkan ya tidak boleh berdekatan otomatis di luar karena di dalam masjid juga hanya 50 persen. Nah ini juga bisa ditanyakan, jadikan bahan untuk tanya soal ya. Ini juga masalah kurban nih, ya. kurban kambing atau sapi dengan harga. Ini bisa dijadikan bahan untuk bertanya. Banyak sekali sebenarnya dasar konteks yang memang dalam kehidupan sehari-hari jadi pemikiran. Setiap keluarga kita mau berkorban atau tidak. Kalau korban kita mau kambing atau sapi. Kalau kambing harganya berapa terus itu itu betul yang real, konteks yang real. Di sini terjadi proses berpikir nantinya ya, dalam membuat keputusan. Nah, itu kira-kira konteks ya. Bahkan ada satu lagi yang menarik, ada uang 75 ribu yang keluar. Ini juga bisa dijadikan, ini numbers ya, angka. Nanti bisa dijadikan soal juga tentunya pada kelas tertentu. Saya kira itu dari saya, ya. mudah-mudahan ikut melengkapi apa yang telah disampilkan tadi. Terima kasih. Oke, baik, terima kasih Prof. Zulkadri untuk apa, jelasannya sangat menarik jadi ini dan mungkin di awal-awal memang benar-benar shock ya jadi membuat shock gitu ya, jadi shock di Indonesia dan yang berikutnya sebenarnya ada di sekitar kita matematika dan tadi banyak memberikan contoh termasuk ini harapan juga menjawab beberapa pertanyaan yang disampaikan lewat registrasi jadi kemarin ada pertanyaan-pertanyaan yang secara umum Bagaimana di masa pandemi uh, literasi matematika bisa diajarkan dan sebagainya tadi sudah harapannya sudah terjawab oleh aparan Prof. Zulkardi tentang bagaimana dan sebenarnya banyak sekali ide-ide dan bisa kita angkat jadi itu ya, ya baik uh, dan ya tadi sudah disampaikan dan Bapak Ibu uh, silakan mungkin kalau ada pertanyaan dan ini kalau kita lihat di sini sebenarnya ada satu pertanyaan dari Prof. 
dari Pak Iwayan Pujat di sini evaluasi dalam pembelajaran matematika terkait PISA sering digunakan beberapa istilah seperti berpikir tingkat tinggi, literasi matematika, berpikir kritis, berpikir kreatif dan sebagainya. Di mana perbedaan esensialnya, Prof. Jadi, jadi dan evaluasi, berkaitan dengan konteks problem statement dan evaluation rubrik. Jadi seperti itu, Prof. Jadi apa perbedaannya? Ya. Ya, terima kasih Mas Adi. Jadi eh, tadi dikatakan bahwa oleh Profesor Kaur juga bahwa tujuan utama dari bisa adalah untuk mendidik anak-anak kita yang usia 15 tahun ini sehingga pada saat mereka tamat sekolah mereka sudah jadi pekerja yang nanti siap untuk bersaing. Apalagi tadi dibilang dari lima terakhir bahwa Singapura itu tidak punya sumber alam dan mereka mengandalkan kemampuan kemampuan yang dibutuhkan oleh pasar kerja. Nah, pasar kerja itu dia tidak butuh mengerjakan soal karena kalau mengerjakan soal itu semuanya ada di komputer. Tapi menurut Pak Toto tadi semua yang rutin itu sudah bisa digunakan komputer mesin. Tapi yang dibutuhkan di tempat kerja itu adalah mana berpikir berpikir untuk misalnya meningkatkan kuota, meningkatkan penghasilan. Ya. Itu berpikir kritis namanya. Atau bagaimana mengusulkan inovasi, itu berpikir kreatif. Ya. Kalau misalnya dalam satu tempat pekerjaan, ya, membuat sesuatu batik misalnya, bagaimana batik ini lebih kreatif, supaya hasilnya nanti bisa laku. Tidak hanya itu-itu saja. Bisa saja misalnya membuat batik matematik, sehingga laku dijual. Nah, itu kemampuan-kemampuan kolaborasi tentunya, ya kemudian kemampuan komunikasi, kemudian kemampuan berpikir komputasi, kemudian juga berpikir uh, compassion. Ini yang kata Menteri Mas Nadim, ada yang baru computational thinking itu bagaimana dia membuat sistem ya uh, seperti komputer. Matematik kembalikan saja, belajar juga algoritma juga ya, sehingga mereka membuat uh, suatu sistem. Nah yang kedua, compassion. Compassion juga kemampuan berpikir tingkat tinggi. Apa compassion itu? Compassion itu empati. Artinya yang bisa membaca pemikiran orang lain. Kalau kita guru, kita bisa membaca pemikiran mahasiswa atau siswa kita. <tuh> Kalau kita pebisnis, kita bisa harus bisa membaca eh, kemampuan eh, maunya konsumer. Keinginan konsumer itu apa? Bayangin kalau misalnya di Tokopedia itu barang-barangnya tidak menarik. Maka semua orang hanya lewat-lewat lewat saja, tidak ada yang stop dan tidak ada yang beli. Maka kita harus butuh composition, empati. Kita butuh menyelami apa kebutuhan pelanggan kita. Maka kita harus tahu gambar-gambarnya harus menarik sesuai dengan kebutuhan simple. Sebagai contoh saja gokar, gojek. Kalau Anda masuk ke gokar, gojek di HP ini, mudah sekali menu-menunya mudah, cara pemakaiannya mudah. Itu, itu semuanya adalah aplikasi matematik. Bahkan matematika kombinatorik ya, yang dipakai di situ dengan menggunakan jarak terpendek, graf. Ini, ini menarik. Ya. Sehingga nanti kalau jualan online, pembeli akan stop. Kalau kita bisa. Itu dipelajari juga lewat matematik. Ya. Bagaimana kita inovatif, berpikir kreatif. Ya. Itu kira-kira dikaitkan dengan matematik. Jadi bukan hanya ngerjain soal, tapi bagaimana logika. Ya mindset cara berpikir kita yang diasah oleh penalaran tadi yang diasah oleh bagaimana berpikir supaya bisa menyelesaikan masalah itu atau bisa menambah konsumer atau bisa menyelesaikan problem-problem itu kira-kira Mas Adi yang kedua ya. Hmm. Belum unmute. Nanti masih unmute kamu. Ya, maaf. Okay. Jadi itu yang tanya dari Pak Haris itu intinya yep. di sini Ya, apa yang dibaca tetapi juga siswa dapat menyelesaikan permasalahan kontekstual dengan computational thinking jadi kurang lebih intinya pertanyaannya ini bisa langsung di apa oke 
Ya, hmm. jadi bagaimana meningkatkan kemampuan siswa untuk memahami apa yang dibaca karena tujuan ya betul. Jadi seperti tadi jelas soalnya kalau saya salut sekali soal tadi yang pertama ya hanya tiang listrik saja bisa dijadikan soal gitu. Itu kita kan setiap hari melihat tiang listrik gitu. Nah, di situ terjadi proses berpikir untuk mengestimasi gitu. Kalau 7 cm tidak mungkin gitu. 70 cm berarti oh enggak mungkin juga. 70 meter enggak mungkin. Anak airnya bisa oke, okay, 7 meter jawabannya. Nah, itu itu yang di pisa soal pisa tadi gitu ya. Jadi bagaimana anak-anak mengestimasi, jadi bukan mengukur langsung tapi mengestimasi berpikir dengan proses membandingkan. Ya. Kemudian juga soal-soal kontekstual itu harus dibiasakan memang seperti tadi ada soal yang ya Misalnya bagaimana seorang petugas masjid membuat ya, alur-alur sehingga sama rata, ya, sama jauh jaraknya sehingga orang tidak mengambil untuk sholat di situ. Nah hal seperti ini, bagaimana di, di Mekah itu orang membuat lingkaran-lingkaran itu itu cara jadi cara membuat konteksnya juga orang menggunakan matematik. Nah kita bagaimana melihat ada matematik di situ? Saya kira itu ya jadi memang bagus ini bahwa di di Kemdikbud itu ada satu direktur namanya Pusat Asesmen dan Pembelajaran Pusmenjar. Nah, pusat inilah bagian dari bawah Pak Toto yang banyak sekarang program-programnya untuk membantu. Ya, saya dengar dalam akhir semester ini ada 16 lokasi nanti ada pelatihan-pelatihan terhadap dinas dan dinas nanti akan mencoba melatihkannya kepada guru. Karena bagaimanapun soal konteks ini harus gurunya berperan serta ya scaffoldingnya itu kata Profesor Kaur tadi sedikit sekali di soal jadi scaffolding itu di guru artinya guru yang nanti ikut membantu sedikit ya mengingatkan sehingga anak-anak terarah dan anak-anak terpancing untuk mengeluarkan nalarnya itu kira-kira Mas Adi baik terima kasih Prof Jilkatwi itu mungkin ini ingat yang disampaikan fundamental Matematik as a human activity kurang lebih seperti ya, Prof. Jadi, Betul, ini. doing matematik kata Profesor Gaur tadi itu memang ciri dari prudental. Dan memang pada saat prudental speech pertama kali di ICMI, pembukaan ICMI, dia sudah mengatakan bahwa matematika itu harus diajarkan dengan useful katanya. Harus bermanfaat. Jika tidak, nggak ada gunanya itu kita guru matematik. Justru guru fisika yang bermanfaat, guru biologi yang bermanfaat. Ketika mereka mengajarkan matematika di aplikasinya. Itu gara Iya. Baik, terima kasih Prof. Zulkadri. Dan satu lagi ini dari Prof. Rahma Johar dari Unsia. Ini nyampaikan, ini menarik presentasi dari Prof. Zulkadri dan bagaimana realisasi bisa sok tersebut dikaitkan dengan pelaksanaan KLM di Indonesia supaya bukan hanya inisiatif LPTK saja. Jadi, ya, KLM, kontes literasi matematika memang terus terang agak tersendat karena memang LPTK-LPTK yang mengadakannya. Saya harap dengan ada seminar ini ini ada organisasi Indo AMS, kemudian ada yang ketuanya Profesor Sukes ini PPTMI nanti akan mengambil serta gitu atau ikut berperan serta supaya kegiatan seperti ini yang memang ya berkaitan dengan kontes literasi matematik atau yang berkaitan dengan PISA ini bisa diambil dan dijadikan satu program tahunan gitu. Ini momen ya. Kalau negara dia sudah punya program sendiri gitu. Jadi memang saya kira organisasi seperti ini atau yang S1 ini bisa juga kita tawarkan ada di IMS namanya. Saya setuju Bu Rahma karena kalau ngandalin LPTK sendiri kadang-kadang ada uang, kadang-kadang tidak gitu. Kadang-kadang enggak perlu disenang bisa, kadang-kadang tidak gitu. Ya jadi mungkin Profesor Sukes mungkin bisa mengambil momentum ini. Terima kasih. Baik, terima kasih Prof. Kadis. Nah, ini juga yang akan saya tanyakan juga terkait bagaimana ini peran dari PPPMI ya. Uh, apa yang menyatakan ini bagaimana perannya untuk mempersiapkan bisa dari bisa dan semoga ini sudah Teman -teman. Saya punya 27, 27 member, jadi nanti pikir bareng. Asik, ya. Ya. Jadi ini mungkin awal, ini jadi okay. kick off uh, project-project kita dan harapannya nanti bisa banyak peran yang akan kita lakukan dan juga tentunya bersama para hadirin yang ada di sini kita bisa bersama-sama membangun apa dan meningkatkan apa kualitas pendidikan matematika di Indonesia. Jadi ya sebenarnya banyak sekali pertanyaan yang disampaikan tapi saya kira juga tidak cukup waktunya untuk kita bahas semuanya Bapak Ibu nanti akan kita rekat kita simpan pertanyaan dan akan saya sampaikan ke Prof Zul dan mungkin Prof Zul akan berkirim email dengan 
Prof Kaur juga mungkin nanti barangkali ada beberapa ya, nanti bisa mungkin akan diupload di website PPPMI mungkin nanti bisa menjadi apa tulisan ya. jadi kurang lebih mungkin nanti bisa di dan Bapak Ibu untuk materi dan informasi lebihnya nanti juga bisa disimak di pppmi.org untuk informasi lebih lanjut jadi itu dan uh, ya saya kira sebenarnya sudah cukup ini sudah jam 12 ini juga uh, sesuai dengan jadwal mungkin agak molor sedikit sudah waktunya sudah uh, habis dan ya yeah, thank you very much for your attention and thank you Prof Zulkarfi and see you uh, next time and hopefully and then I see you in Semarang or in Palembang <laughs> and also <laughs> Professor Kaur and yeah I would like to thank to Professor Kaur and Professor Zulkarfi as a keynote speaker and yeah Thank you for the participant for joining this uh, talk series and yeah, hopefully Professor Kaur and Professor Zulkarfi we can meet in uh, IGMI 14 in Shanghai uh, in the next year. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, International Congress on Mathematics Education 14. Yeah, yeah uh, because uh, this uh, uh, postpones from this year into the next year and yeah, uh, hopefully the talk today will be useful for all of us and thank you for your attention and see you and also good uh, morning or this is a good afternoon and yeah, uh, thank you Prof. Dukati, Pak Sukes and also Prof. Kaur and also yeah, Pak Zuhair, thank you very much and saya kembalikan ke Pak Zuhair, selamat siang, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Pak Adi, for leading the discussion with uh, our two keynote speakers.